I am sitting here with my good friend Francois Duplessis, and uh, we're going to talk about the book Nahum. And there's been a recent discovery in the Middle East, and we'll talk about that, where a fragment of this book was just found on the 16th of March, 2021, this very year. So before we start, can you open for us in prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for the most reliable book in the world, the Bible. Thank you for the story of Nineveh and the prophet Nahum. And as we discuss the latest discoveries, enlighten our minds and give us a greater appreciation of your book, the book from heaven. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now, Francois, the book Nahum is a book of one of the minor prophets. Of course, I don't believe there are minor prophets. You're either a prophet or you're not a prophet, right? But that's what the world titles these books. And it is a literary masterpiece. Now, I think it is very important that this book should have been found at this point in history, or that a fragment of it should have been found because it authenticates it way back in history. And I am of the conviction that this book has something to do with our time, because the Bible says that these things were written for our admonition. Now, Francois, you are one of the few people that have actually been to Nineveh and seen the ruins of Nineveh. So tell us a little bit about that. I first want to show you two books, Walter. Francois, these are very, very old books. They are falling apart at the seams. And like these books on the shelf behind me, they smell moldy. And when you open them, then it has a date in here, and it says 1850. And these two books deal with the discovery of Nineveh, and it's Layard's famous works on Nineveh. These are very rare manuscripts, and uh, how long have they been on your shelf? Well, it comes from my father. He was a student. So, so you weren't born round about 1850. A little later. <laughs> a little later. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about Nineveh. You went to the site. You know, I read a book by Oli Berg, a famous archaeologist. And he was discussing the fact that in 1990, something happened at Nebe Yunus. This, one, this is one of the mounds of Nineveh. The other one is Kuyun Yik. And archaeologists were convinced that this is the palace of Esarhaddon, as well as his armory. But they couldn't go in there because it was on a holy site, the tomb of Nabi Yunus, the prophet Nahum. But Saddam Hussein, now I want to give him credit, he overruled the Islamic law and he gave the archaeologists <laughs> the green light and they started to discover Seven huge lambusas. You know these bulls with a the face. The massive bulls of yeah, the Assyrians. Yeah, the yes. face of a man. And I said, Lord, <laughs> you know my love for archaeology? Please, let me go there. And wonder above wonder, Walter, I managed to get into Iraq, but they wouldn't let me uh, go up to Nineveh because the Americans were doing bombings up there. And the next time I said, I'm here to go to Nineveh. And they were re very reluctant, but I went there and I saw with my own eyes <laughs> the excavations. And this was World News in 1990. He had to remove 400 families from that area mm -hmm. and gave the archaeologists the go-ahead to discover it. But they didn't discover everything. Now, the next great World News was in 1914, 
when I saw the L stands for Levant, they wanted to occupy this entire Middle East. <laughs> when they destroyed part of Nineveh, they smashed the, the, the beautiful artifacts. And we were all in tears. But you know, God has got a way to change the, the curse into a blessing, according to Nehemiah 13 verse 2. <laughs> so in 1917, ISIL was pushed out. And then the archaeologists went into the tunnels that they've excavated. They there found were a number of tunnels that they found. Yes. Yeah, yeah when they got down there, <laughs> these are on my, on my latest uh, research on the book of Nineveh. It will be on YouTube, uh, Amazing Discoveries, within a month or so. Where I show the pictures, what they discovered there, as well as the name of Esarhaddon. Esarhaddon is mentioned in the Bible. So an, another cornerstone. Uh, yes, in this wonderful building of biblical archaeology. Now I know your passion because uh, your big passion is to show that this book is the truth. Now. Before this discovery, as written in these volumes of yours over here, there was a lot of talk that uh, Nineveh is a myth. No, oh, where do you find it? Show it, us where it is. The Bible no says Nineveh. And, you know, the book of Jonah and all of these things. What's the story? These are mythological stories in the Bible. But then this man, Layard, they discovered the ruins of Nineveh, and that's where these two volumes came into existence, and it was world news, as you state. Now, it's very important to me that at this time in history in which we are living, with all of these lockdown issues and uh, pandemics in the world, that attention should again be directed to the book of Nahum, and I want to do a typological study on the book of Nahum, bringing it to the time in which we are living. Because I found it interesting in the article, we'll look at it in a moment, where they discuss the discovery of these scrolls with the particular verses of the book of Nahum in them. And one of the comments underneath was from one of the comments of the people out there, was, I'm wondering whether God in his providence allowed the discovery of this book at this time in history. Is he trying to tell us something? And I believe that the stories of these events in history are typological and that we need to study them to understand where we are standing in the stream of time. So, Francois... Uh, the talk is titled, The Book of Nahum, A Warning to Nineveh. And uh, I cannot think of anyone better to talk about some of the archaeological issues and uh, the historic issues than yourself. So we will go through this together, and then later we will look at some of the other aspects. So I will continue with this. Now, in this book, you have this picture over here of Nineveh and its remains. And the book became a bestseller in the time when it was published in 1850. And if you open it up in this very fragile book that's falling apart, then you will see that very picture that is on the screen at the moment. So this is very historically significant. And you know what, Walter? The tomb of Nahum, it's about 60 k's north of Nineveh. The American, I don't know from which fund it comes, uh, has donated $500,000 to restore this very important site. So somehow the focus is on Nahum. 
book name is yes. World News at the moment. Yeah, you can you can check this on internet. <laughs> you can see the he is he is he's burial tomb. It's a, it's a it's beautiful. Now here are the ruins of Uruk, or the biblical Erech, and uh, Ashurbanipal discovered two important clay tablets there in the time of the Assyrians, and he took them to his library. And there they lay, right? Today they are where, these clay tablets? About this Ashurbanipal, wherever he conquered a city, he, he collected all the clay tablets, 22,000 of them. Walter, this was God sent. And he built a library in Nineveh, uh, and the on modern libraries are, are built on, on his structure. <laughs> and uh, two of the most important discoveries he made in uh, this place, Uruk, oh, I've done a series on Uruk as well, uh, were two famous clay tablets. Now, this is the place where written words were started. You know, before the flood, they, they remembered everything. They had brilliant minds. Yeah. They didn't need to write things down. Yeah. Seven generations lived contemporaneously. So Noah and his sons came with these brilliant minds. And for quite a few centuries, they didn't need to write. And eventually, they started to forget at Uruk. <laughs> and that's where they started to s develop the signs of writing. So this is a very important place. And it's what's very interesting, Francois, is the timing of the events. If you look at the prophetic writings, I mean, the, the science of archaeology is a very young science, and the dates when these things happened are fascinating to me. The one is 1798, and biblically that's a very important date because that is where the papal power who went into captivity. And in the book of Daniel, it tells us that that is the commencement of the time of the end when knowledge will be increased. And that is when the science of archaeology actually started. Isn't yeah. that correct? Yeah. Merle Unger in his book, Archaeology of the Old Testament. Of course, Napoleon took all the scientists into Egypt. So Merrill Unger actually mentions the date 1798. Yes, the birth of archaeology. But this was limited only to the hieroglyphics. And then the cuneiform were deciphered, give me the yes. date. Yes, this ghost, now we go to Iran, to a place called the Behustan Rock, with the Raiz, the first. By the way, he's, he, he, he took his throne name from a previous Darius the Mede. Yes. Uh, so the book of Daniel is very authentic. And there, yeah, yes. And then, you that, that's another study. But he mentions the three cuneiform languages that were discovered there. One of them, the Elamite, deciphered it in 1844. All right, so you have the, the birth of the science of archaeology, 1798, beginning of the time of the end. The deciphering of the cuneiform, one of the cuneiform writings, 1844. And that sets the stage for the authentication of this book. And it links it to the time of the end in which we are now living. So, very interesting. This is part of Nineveh where they did not do any digs, as you can see. But the prophet... Uh, Zephaniah also predicted that Nineveh would land into this situation, runes upon runes upon runes. Now, why was Nineveh destroyed? That is the, the question we need to answer. And the reason, of course, it was the wicked city, and it is a type of the situation as we find it at the end of the world, just before the coming of Christ and the destruction of wickedness. So it's also interesting to me that one of those two clay tablets that we spoke about uh, was the Gilgamesh epic. 
And that was lost for 2,500 years until it was discovered again in 1844 when a British adventurer discovered ancient Nineveh and the libraries of its kings in a mound near what is now Mosul, Iraq. Now, Francois, the Gilgamesh epic is a fascinating clay tablet because it talks about a universal flood, right? And archaeology, in other words, confirms here that the ancients believed in a universal flood. And seven of the statements from the Gilgamesh epic are in harmony with seven statements on the flood story of Genesis. Yeah, the, it's not all the same, yeah. but it, it does put emphasis on the flood. And of course, 1844 is the year in which Darwin conceived the origin of species. It says so in the origin of species right in the beginning, in the introduction. And in Revelation, it tells us in the first angel's message that you must worship God and give him the glory for the hour of his judgment has come. So a conflict is set up between God and his word and what the world is saying, which is the opposite because geology denies a universal flood because it would destroy the evolution theory. They will only admit to local floods. And it's interesting that the year again is 1844, linking it to this important time period in which we are living. And here is another fragment. The Enuma Elish is a Babylonian epic poem describing the beginning of the cosmos, the birth of the gods, the rise to dominance of the god Marduk, and the creation of humanity. Tell us about this clay tablet. You know, we went to Ebla in Syria. Do you remember? Yes. And they've discovered the Enuma Elish there as well. Uh -huh. So it's more than one discovery. And suddenly, here they find a, a clay tablet where it says man was created. <laughs> there are so many interesting discoveries where, where God came down, he made the human from clay, and he breathed into his nose, like the book of Genesis say. So uh, these are gems that I've discovered in my research. Just but confirm the biblical author authority. So... Your passion is to prove that the Bible is authentic? No, to confirm it. Uh -huh. I don't have to prove it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Bible has many <laughs> other aspects besides archaeology. It has the prophetic word, and the prophetic word is an authentication par excellence. There's nothing like it. Actually, it is the prophetic word that convinced me that the Bible was truth, but you come from the archaeological angle because you were born believing that the Bible is truth. <laughs> but Francois, what is interesting to me is that this god Marduk, who was also very prominent in the region in the time of the Assyrians, and there was sometimes conflict between who worshipped which deity, etc. But the god Marduk, to me, it's very interesting because when you look at the occult sciences, Marduk is the one that has the authority from Anu to rule the world. And there's a book written by Tapasosi, which is Rulers of Evil. And he talks about Marduk quite a lot. And Marduk had a sign which he received from Anu which was the sign of his authority to rule over the children of evil. And that sign was basically two crosses, one inside the other within mm. a circle. And uh, we'll come to that later. Now here, Francois, you're a little bit more juvenile here, if I may say so. I look like Martin here. Yes, and <laughs> when we look at this set, people might think that uh, Martin has aged. <laughs> Tell us about this slide. You know, it was a miracle for me to get there 
but they had no guides. This man was a a, a steward on uh, Iraqi Airways. He could hardly speak English. So with my little knowledge, few people came with me. I had to try to explain everything that happened here. And uh, I had a battle. But where is this? This is one of the ruins of Nineveh. And if you look to the right, you can see some of the artwork. Over here? Yes. Yes. And there, there you uh, to, to your right, you can see the uh, part of a wheel sticking out there. So this is, is telling us of its past glory. You know, when you come to places like this, it's written in a Bible, and here you see it. You can feel it, and you, you smell it. It's, it's a great... I've been there three years in a, a row here and four years in Babylon, Iraq, and a few years ago, two years ago, I went back to Iraq, but I couldn't get here. Now, Francois, when in 1990 Saddam said, you can go and dig despite Islamic law, this is what they dug up, and here you see one of the Assyrian bulls, and I see you standing there. Tell us about this picture. The, the Bible speaks about Esarhaddon. But where do you get evidence of the existence yeah. of an Assyrian king like him? I'm standing with Loretta, my daughter, at one of his lamasus, one of the huge bulls that's been excavated right here. To the back, you have the tomb of Lebe Yunus, the prophet Nahum. That's over there at the back. Over yeah. There. So this was world news, and I said, Lord, I want to get there. It was a miracle to get there. On the last minute, we get, got a visa to, from Jordan to enter into uh, Iraq. So this is it. But, but this is world news, Walter. ISIL, 2014, world news. And they destroyed many of these sites. Yes, they destroyed some of these Lamusos. And it's a pity, at the Nergal Gate there were some of them and they chopped, chopped them up with a hammer. But then in 2017 they were defeated or driven out and so the archaeologists could go and dig again. Yes, and they went down and they discovered the tunnels that... ISIL was looking for artifacts and gold because this was the wealthiest city in its days. But Thanks. they found more than wealth. They found evidences of the book, the Bible. So, so, now, so now, Francois, we've, we've established that Nineveh was a real place, that the Bible is not a book of mythology, and uh, the book Nahum warns the Assyrian nation, and the city Nineveh in particular, that a time of retribution is coming. But before that, there was a time of grace, Jonah. Jonah. So we'll two prophets Jonah. brought messages. We'll come to that. Now, here is the article from March 16, 2021, where the new Dead Sea Scroll fragments were found in Israel. And it says here, archaeologists from the Israel Antiquities Authority have discovered dozens of parchment fragments of a biblical scroll which is written in Greek. It was written in Koine Greek, wasn't it? Koine Greek. It means the common, common. The, the common Greek of the time. And bears portions of the book of 12 minor prophets, including the book of Zechariah and Nahum. And you did research on Zechariah. Yes. Is there a link? How can people get to that interesting research? You now, I find it fascinating that these two <coughs> books, Zechariah and Nahum should now be world news again, right? Now, I did a series on Zechariah, and uh, we can put a link in and people can look in it, because as in the case of the book of Nahum, I honestly believe that the book of Zechariah is written more for our time than for that time. I agree with you. Because there are many, many portions <coughs> in that book that pertain only to what is happening right now in the world. So the same applies to the book of Nahum. And so uh, I think it is a timely thing that we should 
discuss these books, particularly in the light of current events. I believe the warning of the book of Nahum is a warning to the world right now. Hmm. So the fragments of, the, of a Dead Sea Scroll were found in the cave of Hora in the Judean desert. And the cave, roughly 80 meters below the cliff top, is flanked by gorges and there's a sheer cliff. And this definitely is an exciting moment as we present and reveal to the public an important and significant piece of history and culture of the land of Israel, so said the archaeologist. Now, they were able to identify 11 lines of Zechariah from chapter 8, verse 16 to 17, and this is uh, one of the sentences there. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to one another, render true perfect justice in your gates, and do not contrive evil against one another, and do not love perjury, because all those are things that I hate, declares the Lord. And this was the fragment in the book of Nahum that they found. The mountains quake because of him and the hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his wrath? Who can resist his fury? His anger pours out like fire and rocks are shattered because of him. So here is an announcement of judgment. And uh, as you always point out, there is a time of judgment, but God is also a God of mercy. So there are two sides to him. So the very next verse, which they didn't have there, said the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust him. So Noam was inviting Nineveh to come to the God of Jonah and be saved. Yes, because once before they had a warning and they listened. But this time, they did not listen. This is interesting, Francois. Now, if you go to the history sources, and uh, I know that uh, Wikipedia is an open source, but uh, it does have some interesting things to say here. Here's an artist's impression of the Assyrian palaces. So they were, they were sumptuous, right? They were impressive. World class. Uh, I've been to the British Museum, together with you, and alone. And I looked at some of those uh, huge displays that they have of the Assyrian Empire. They're absolutely incredible. Now, let's read something interesting here, because we need to understand some of the things. The Nineveh has different pronunciations in the Arabic and the Syriac and the Romanized and Akkadian languages, and it was an ancient Assyrian city of Upper Mesopotamia, uh, located on the outskirts of the modern Mosul. It is located on the eastern bank of the Tigris River, and it was the capital and the largest city of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And it also was the largest city in the world for several decades. So it's a very important place. It's amazing that it just disappeared. Nobody believed that it existed. Right? Nam prophesied that it, this is the only city, this, this phenomenon. Suddenly they were world rulers and suddenly they were gone. So in other words, could it happen again, Francois? It is going to happen again and you're going to do the eschatology. I think that is where we're heading. So that is why this book is so important. Because what happened to Nineveh is a foreshadowing of what is going to happen to the entire world. Here's an artist impression of a hall in an Assyrian palace. You can see these massive winged bulls where you stood a moment ago. And the English place name comes from the Latin Nineveh and the Septuagint Greek 
under the influence of the biblical Hebrew, Nineveh, the Akkadian, Ninua, the old Babylonian, Ninua. The original meaning of the name is unclear, but may have referred to a patron goddess. Now this gets interesting. The cuneiform for Nina is a fish within a house. And the Aramaic Nuna is a fish. This may have simply been intended as a place of fish or may have indicated a goddess associated with fish or the tigress, possibly originally of Hururian origin. And the city was later devoted to the goddess Ishtar of Nineveh, who is also often depicted as a fish. And Nina was one of the Sumerian and Assyrian names of that goddess. So, Francois, we must look at these clues for the time that we are living in. So here was a goddess associated with the fish involved in Nineveh. <laughs> uh, is the fish a prominent symbol in the world we live in today? Yes. What is the symbol of Christianity? You've done a lot of research on that. <laughs> yes, it is the fish. And uh, is there a true Christianity in the world and a false Christianity in the world? Yeah, in the catacombs you have the true fish, you know. But there's another one. Yes. Jesus said we must be fishers of men, right? Yeah. But the, the symbol of the fish can also be used incorrectly. So the Etherians worshipped many gods. They were polytheists, right? And uh, you put together a list over here. So they had the cult of Inanna, or Ishtar, which may have been associated with a variety of sexual rites and was continued by the East Semitic-speaking people, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, who succeeded and absorbed the Sumerians in the region. She was especially beloved by the Assyrians, who elevated her to become the highest de deity in their pantheon, ranking above their own national god, Ashur. So this female deity became very prominent. She was a prostitute, par excellence. And the cult was, was such a rubbish. It was so defiled. That Constantine said, it's gone. He stopped the practice. So this practice, you are saying, continued right up until the time of Constantine. Yes. And he stopped it. Yeah. But it probably went underground, right, Francois? Man, is, you know, when I do research, it pops up. I didn't ask for the lady to appear between the old stones. <laughs> but there she is. And maybe there's a lesson. Watch out. For the god, goddess of sex and war. So sexuality, presumption, God calls false religion whoredom. Yes. And he associates it with this kind of religion, right? Essential religion. Now, in Nana, Ishtar is alluded to in the Hebrew Bible and she greatly influenced the Phoenician goddess Ashtoreth, who later influenced the development of the Greek goddess Aphrodite. So, in other words, they, they got different names, but they were basically the same thing, right? Yeah. Now, you were telling me, and this is very fascinating to me, you were telling me some time ago, and this is where, you know, it is so useful to have a friend like Francois. To develop your character, Walter. <laughs> no, not only that. <laughs> you're very good at that. But <laughs> besides that, you were telling me that there was a historic period when a king sent a princess to a, let's call it an ancient ecumenism. And there, there was an attempt by this lady to bring all the religions together. And in order to do that, they just took the the attributes of the deities and applied them to the different times. Tell us about that story. 
the first Sargon, there were more than one Sargons, but the very first one, Akkadian, he sent his daughter, En He Du Anna. Anna always refers to heaven. And she became the high priest of a temple in Ur of the Chaldeans, where Abram was born. Yes. And her mission and vision from her father's point of view was to create an ecumenical climate. So she changed the names, but it was still the same God. Utu means son in Sumerian. It was changed to Shamash in uh, Akkadian. And of course in Hebrew, Shemesh, Bet Shemesh. And the same Nana was the moon god. She changed his name to Suen. So what she did, and you know if you go to the internet, they are still studying her stuff from those days. All the literature is, is available. But th this was the birthplace of an ecumenical movement. So what we see today happened during the time of Abram. So it is quite plausible to eventually have a one world religion with the deities with different names apparently being the same. But, uh, you know, I have a, a very important point of reference. And that is that the deity that I serve had a son. And that son died for my sins. That's a very unique thing. And the Bible says that that son is the only means of salvation. So any form of this kind of ecumenism where you're saying that the deities have different names but they're all one and the same can be verified by the fact whether they have a son or not, right? So interesting that uh, her cult, this goddess, continued to flourish until its gradual decline between the 1st and 6th centuries AD in the wake of Christianity, though it survived in parts of Upper Mesopotamia among Assyrian communities as late as the 18th century. Now, Francois, I don't know whether I agree with that. I believe that the cult of Ishtar survived and was incorporated into Christianity. The essential aspect of religion you know, you, it's, it's sickening to read about the sexual orgies of this cult. That is correct. But the, the fact that a female deity in some form was introduced into Christianity cannot be denied. Because the Bible tells us that the dead know nothing. They sleep. But in Roman Catholicism, you have the cult of Mary where she is alive and is your intercessor. And Pope John Paul II even said that he is, was not averse to the idea that she should actually be part of the Godhead. Remember our visit in Rome to Cappuccini? Yes. And via Veneto, where she has marks of uh, crucifixion in her hands. Correct. So she becomes the mediator, she becomes the mediatrix, she becomes uh, the advocate for the people of God. And in a subtle way, Jesus Christ is sidelined and substituted. Now Mary was a very, very uh, important figure in the Bible. And Mary had a very, very important role. But it did not include mediation and nor did she become the saviour of the world through the marks of the crucifixion. You've uh, visited two of her tombs, one in Turkey and the, one, the other one in Israel. So. so how can there be a tomb <laughs> if, according to uh, Roman Catholicism, she ascended into heaven? There should be no tomb, right? So, Francois, here was an article in uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, ninth edition, the second article, and they refer to Dagon, 
also spelled Dagon in other places, a creature part man and part fish. That this fish god Dagon was an object of reverent worship in early Babylonia and Assyria is clear from the monuments. Now, this fish deity, he had the fish mitre on his head and in the ancient reliefs he has the fish cape behind him and he also has a little pail over here with holy water. <laughs> now, don't we find that in the world today? Well represented. Is there a religious system that wears a mitre, a fish mitre, no longer with the fish cape behind it, but with gorgeous robes of purple and red, and they dispense holy water in the same way? So this religion has just been incorporated in a subtle way, and people don't even recognize it. Now, one of the things about the ancient cultures, which would include Nineveh, was that they practiced human sacrifice. And they had a very interesting religious system, which was the substitute king. Now, Francois, you have done a lot of study on the substitute king, and I find this fascinating. Now, according to what you told me, I'll let you tell the story, but uh, according to what you told me, when certain curses were pronounced, we'll look at the curses just now, upon a nation, uh, the ancients had a way to try and circumvent these curses. And so when they received the book of Nahum, as a warning to the Ninevites, there are very specific curses in the book of Nahum and judgments that are going to fall onto Nineveh. And they might have, it's just a possibility, have used this substitute king to circumvent the story. And the curses. Could you explain the substitute king theology yeah. to us? The one that started this was uh, Esar Hardon. Man, this was a very interesting king. And I studied the psychology of these Assyrian kings, their emotions. But whenever there was an eclipse, the sun, they felt this is dangerous. So they were very interested in uh, the signs in the stars, right? Yeah. So when they wanted to avert curses, they got a retarded person, put him on the throne, had free access to the harem, clothed him like a king. Man, this chap was so happy. He didn't know what was going to happen at the end of that time. For a hundred days. Then they would kill him. This was cruel, Walter. And they thought, now the curse is gone. We can carry on as usual. And uh, Esarhaddon did this four times. And Esarhaddon, I found only one instance where he also used the substitute king to avert curses. Well, you know, Francois, this is a gross perversion of a real substitute king. Mm that took a curse on my behalf and your behalf. He was not a retarded king, but he was the king of the universe. And it tells us uh, something about the character of God, that there is a substitute king who takes a curse that is for me and bears it on my behalf. That's the beautiful story of the gospel. So these ancients must have had some vague idea in a very distorted way and twisted it around. I always say the devil is the master of reversal and used this to avert a calamity and to continue with business as usual. But the true substitute king says we must repent 
and we must change our lives mm. and we must not have business as usual. Not visit the harem. Not visit the harem. So none of the minor prophets seem to equal Naum in boldness, ardor and sublimity. His prophecy forms a regular and perfect poem. The exordium, the introductory part of a treatise, is not merely magnificent, it is majestic. The preparation for the destruction of Nineveh and the de description of its downfall and desolation are expressed in the most vivid colors and are bold and luminous in the highest degree. You know, in the Hebrew, <clears throat> when it speaks in the book Nahum of the flood that would was part of the destruction elements, it sounds like running water. It is beautiful in the original Hebrew. You, you lose it in English. But that's why they say it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. And then his reverence for the Almighty, trust in divine justice and goodness, condemnation of national iniquity, positive conviction that God will keep his word. And these are qualities of true greatness. Add to that Nahum's mighty intellect, his patriotism, courage, rare, almost unequaled gift of vivid presentations. And he indeed looms as one of those outstanding figures in human history who have appeared only at rare intervals. Francois, the world needs messages like this today. Definitely. Now, you penned those words, and uh, I congratulate you. Let's have a look at the purpose of the book. So, the purpose is that they're going to punish Nineveh. God is going to pun punish Nineveh. And we read that in Nahum 1, 1 to 15. So, there's a superscription. The power of God to punish the wicked comes from verse 2 to 8. And then the certainty of the coming punishment. So there's a warning and there is authority behind the warning. Then and there's an invitation. I'm a good God if you want to serve me. I'm better than Ishtar or Marduk. And then in chapter 2, there's a description of Nineveh's coming destruction, the siege and the capture of the city, and the plundering of the city. So it's going to be destroyed. And then chapter 3 gives the reasons, Nineveh's wickedness and why she's going to be punished, chapter 3, 1 to 7. The destruction of No Amun is mentioned in, in this book, which is the modern Luxor we've been yes, there. Yes, Thebes, ancient Thebes, yeah. And uh, that's described in 3, 8 to 11. Tell us who destroyed No Amun. This is the great Ashur Banipal, the last great king. And uh, Thebes, Nineveh, Luxor, <coughs> had allies all, all over the, the area there. So he was quite strong because of his allies. But uh, the Assyrians had no allies. They only had enemies. And if uh, the Assyrians could destroy... Thebes, looks all. God is going to allow enemies to destroy Nineveh. Now it's interesting to me that Luxor, we were there, the ancient Thebes, is the place where uh, the pharaohs are buried. It's the place where you have these magnificent columns and you have the worship of those ancient deities. And they didn't protect no Amun. <laughs> and so the gods of the Assyrians won't protect them either. If God says it's going to be destroyed, it's going to be destroyed. Yeah, now, now you made this prophecy. That's so interesting. It is such an important book. It, it gives us the chronology of his time. And then there's the finality and the <coughs> completeness of Nineveh's destruction, chapters 3, 12 to 19. And then there are a number of literary styles in the book of Nahum. The chiasms. Now tell us about this chiasm, Francois. Well, there's a sample. Just read it. Here's a very simple example, as you state. A chiasm 
chiasm would be I eat, A. To live, B. I live, B. To eat. That's a simple form yeah. of chiasm. This is a... Two different meanings. Two different meanings. <coughs> so this is what Nahum made use of. And so, for example, here's an example. A Syrian king is taunted and Judah is urged to celebrate. This is 1, 2 to 15. There's a call to alarm in the next verses. Then there's a taunt, the announcement of judgment, and then a woe. That's Oregon, the middle. In the middle of the chiasm. Then again, the other half of the chiasm, announcement of judgment, 3, 5 to 7, a taunt, a call to alarm, and the Assyrian king taunted as others celebrate. So you have a complete chiasm. It is brilliant, Walter. It is brilliant. You know, that's why we're astonished at such a literally masterpiece. And as you said, people should, I hope, just go to the book and read the three chapters and ask God to enlighten their mind. Now this uh, chiastic structure is uh, something that is very prevalent in the Bible. And uh, the only other place where I have found it outside the Bible is in the writings of... The Desire of Ages, the beautiful. Desi beautiful <laughs> chiasms. Now we spoke about that in a, in a previous discussion on the lesser and the greater light, right? Yeah. Now, we also have the story of a long-suffering God because this was not the first warning to Nineveh. So my question here is, was Nineveh warned and given a chance before? And we read there in Jonah chapter 3 from verse 3. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Francois, tell us the story. Was there a king that repented? The king that ruled, this is interesting chronology, during the time of Jonah, was called Adat Nirari III. And I've done research on this man. How I discovered something interesting, good in his life. The Bible says he, he came to the place where he took out his royal garments, sat on the ash heap, torn his clothes and had some sand on his head. Good. So there was repentance. There was repentance. And when you read the annals, Suddenly there was a religious uh, reformation in the Assyrians. Suddenly there's a break in the wars that they were fighting during this time. The same thing that happened in, in Egypt, Akhenaten and Nefertiti. There was also a religious awakening. Uh, yes. And they went to monotheism, from polytheism. You gave me a slide, you took it at the British Museum, where you can read the conversion of Adat Nirari III. Right at the end, he appeals to the reader, there's only one God, worship him. So the story of Jonah is not a myth, is it's that not what you're myth. saying? It's not a myth. Now what's interesting, Francois, to me, is the Bible says that he was swallowed by a fish. And there he climbed out of the mouth of the fish. And these people must have been exceedingly impressed because they worship a fish deity. <laughs> so in their minds, they received a message directly in the very nuance of their fish god, turning it around, and they accepted the message but not for very long. They went back to their ways, and by the time we get to Nahum, it's a different story, right? So here is Jonah's tomb before it was destroyed by ISIL. Now that's a terrible thing. They hated Jonah. 
is silver. Why? Because it's biblical. It's the Christian religion. And it shows that the Bible is true. Yes. And so they destroyed this ancient tomb. It no longer exists. Yeah, they wanted to remove evidences, but you cannot remove the evidences of God's word. So fortunately you got that picture before the destruction, right? Yeah, I've got quite a few of it. <laughs> Excellent. So that was the result of his preaching. They were actually converted. And then you have a parallel in our time, the Reformation. Yes, and you did research on the Reformation and Luther. Can you see the parallel here? Now, we're just giving an introduction to the book of Nahum. We'll be going into some of the details later. But it seems as if history repeats itself. There was a warning even to the Christian world. And there was a reformation. There was a Nadat Herari three. Let's just put it that way. In other words, part of Christendom that accepted the message of salvation in Christ and Christ alone and to live by his word and no other. And a lot of them rejected it. And we're now living in a time when that reformation has been watered down and become null and void through the ecumenical movement. Mm. And isn't it time now for that second warning, the Nahum warning, to come to the Christian world today? We're living in fascinating times. Walter, I like what you say. So it's not a book written in ancient times no. for ancient people. It's a... It's the word of God. As you say, it's warning us. The three angels' messages is another warning, and you're a specialist on explaining the exegesis of those future verses. So let's look at a few parallels. Here you have a relief of the Assyrian military, and you can see this pile of heads over here, and this trampling underfoot. So they were a ruthless power. Any opposition was ruthlessly put down. And here is an enlargement of all these decapitated people and people trampled underfoot. You know, we do have military powers today that can be ruthless, even if the ruthlessness comes from the sky and not from hand-to-hand -hand combat. So I want to ask a question. Was Babylon ever warned and given a chance like Jonah gave Nineveh a chance? Jeremiah 51 9 says, We would have healed Babylon, but she's not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone into his own country, for her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. And then there's a very interesting verse in Revelation chapter 2 where it talks about the Middle Church, which historians all claim is the Church of the Middle Ages, referring to the Roman Catholic Church. And it says in that verse, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, that is, mm -hmm. her apostasy and the worship of false deities, and she repented not. So God is a very merciful God. He gives you opportunities. He brings about a reformation, and people can accept it or reject it. And when they reject it, eventually they face the consequences. Another very important thing that you brought out, Francois, is that uh, the Neo-Assyrian treaty curses were a very prominent feature. Tell us about these treaty curses. You know, most of them come from Esarhaddon, the vessel treaties of Esarhaddon. So he, he conquers, say for instance, Ashdod. If you don't obey me, brrr, here are the curses. This is what will happen. Yes. And this prophet Nahum took all these curses, which they curse their vassals, with which they curse their vassals, and turn them around. Yes. <laughs> here it is. You did this, Syria, Nineveh. This is going to happen to you. To happen. 
So basically, this is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah. So we don't have to go into great detail here, but let's just briefly go. The great gods of heaven and earth, they dwell throughout the world, each one whose name is recorded on this tablet. So these are the clay tablets where it was found, clay tablet 472 to 493. And then they will have curses like, may they strike you, these gods. May they frown upon you. May they curse you furiously with a sickening curse. Snatch away your well-being. May they make your ghost thirst for water. May shadow and sunshine constantly overpower you. May you find no refuge in the alcove's shelter. May food and water abandon you. Famine and all of these interesting things. And your maidens and your youth. And may dogs and pigs drag them through the streets of Ashur. This was written in the in the yeah, contract. This is the religious capital, Ashur. So these were cruel gods. That's why when Christianity was introduced, people just grabbed it. Here's another kind of a god. And there are some of the parallels between what is written in the book Nahum and then these vassal treaties of Esar Hadon. So if you read in uh, Nahum 1 verse 8, you have the curse of darkness. And if you go to the parallel, the darkness and the vassal treaties, you'll find them on the clay tablets 422 and 424. The destruction of your name and posterity, Nahum 114. And you will find the similar introduced in these clay tablets. And then the destruction of the chariots mentioned in Nahum 2.13. And uh, the punishment of the prostitutes, you find these also in the vassal treaties. So interesting parallels. And then they go on and on and on. You know, he must have done tremendous research. He studied this enemy. Now, Francois, here's an interesting point. There are people in the world that say, you must just preach love. Nothing, nothing else. But here's the prophet Nahum, and he must have studied the writings of these enemies of God's people, because he quotes them. <laughs> Do you think it's right, Francois, to know your enemy in the time that we live in? You know, when you look at the messages of the different prophets, Nahum is an exception. He says, what you sow, you will reap. And the language in which he describes it. So they, they knew exactly what was going to happen to them. When uh, Nineveh was destroyed by Seachres, the first, and Nabopolassar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, it happened exactly as it was prophesied. It is the greatest, <laughs> it's just a fantastic book. And I wish our viewers would just read that book and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten their minds because it's not only written for Nineveh, it's written for me. So when you actually know what these people are doing, then it is not judgmental to show them their mistakes. It's love. It's love. Thank you. So drying up of the waters is mentioned in Nahum 1.4 and I read some historical data on this. There are people that say that this literally happened uh, as in the case of Babylon where the waters also dried up and the waters receded so that the armies could uh, invade them. So this seems to be one of the ways in which God works, right? And in the book of Revelation, where the waters become a symbol of the peoples, the nations, the multitudes, they will also dry up. In other words, the source of power for modern-day Babylon will also dry up. So these are just some of the parallels. We do not have to go into all the details. And uh, here you can see some of the clay tablets with these uh, particular curses. Now, here are some of the statements that we find in the Spirit of Prophecy about Nineveh. And it's called in the Bible the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that mm. said in our heart, I am and there is none beside me. 
became a desolation, empty and void and waste. The dwelling of lions and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walked and the lion whelps, and none made them afraid. Referring to Nahum 2, verses 10 and 11. And then looking forward to the time when the pride of Assyria would be brought low, Zephaniah also prophesied about Nineveh. Flocks shall lie down in the midst of her. All the beasts of the nations, both the cormorant and the bittern, shall lodge in the upper lintel of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the threshold, for she shall uncover the cedar work. So she was totally destroyed. Great was the glory of the Assyrian realm. Great was its downfall. The prophet Ezekiel, carrying farther the figure of the noble cedar tree, plainly foretold the fall of Assyria. And then it says in Prophets and Kings, page 366, that the pride of Assyria and its fall are to serve as an object lesson to the end of mm. time. Mm. Of nations of earth today who are in arrogance and pride array themselves against him. God inquires, To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness amongst the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. The Lord is good, a stronghold in day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood he will make an utter end of all who endeavor to exalt themselves above the Most High. And this is the warning for the time in which we are living. I believe that this time of retribution is at hand. So in any way was the center of crime and wickedness. Francois, are the cities of the world today centers of crime and wickedness? I think we're excelling. It's called the bloody city full of lies. Have we heard lies lately? We don't hear about truth lately. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So the prophet Nahum compares the Ninevites to a cruel lion upon whom he inquired, has not come your unceasing evil. Nahum 3, 1 and 19. So in his arrangement of the evildoers in Nineveh, he says, woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies in, and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of prancing horses and of jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there is a multitude of slain. Behold, I am against thee, says the Lord of hosts. Nahum 3 verse 1 to 5. So with unerring accuracy, the infinite one still keeps account of the nations. Mm. While his mercy is tendered, with calls to repentance, this account remains open. But when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath begins. The account is closed, the divine patience ceases, mercy no longer pleads in their behalf. And this is what I want to talk about in the book of Nahum. Because Francois, in Revelation 18 verse 1, we read, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for one hour is thy judgment come. This is a prophesied judgment that is just ahead of us. And the book of Nahum is the parallel book. So if we study the book of Nahum, we can find the reasons for the destruction of modern-day Babylon. Because as we saw, it was totally destroyed. It couldn't even be found until these people went and dug it up. Just in time for the people living in our time to know that the Bible is true. So what will they be saying? Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, 
and verse 19, and they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. So this refers to the merchants of modern Babylon. Now, Francois, let's look at just one of the parallels before we go into the detail. Here's a, here's a verse in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 31, where it talks about these nations. And it says one of their sins was that they sacrificed their children. They sacrificed their children. And uh, it seems unthinkable to us that that should have happened. But this was an ancient ritual, an ancient practice. Just tell us about it. Yeah, in Yucharet, we've been to Yucharet. You can read it in their literature. Uh, you know, they made a fire and they let little boys run through it. If you make it, they'll spoil you for the rest of your life. If you don't make it, they kill you. So this was custom. It was denied previously, but with the Yucharet tablets, they say, well, this, this was common. So there's indisputable evidence that Child sacrifice was part and part of the ritual and religion of the ancient people. And more and more skeletons, skeletons of babies are being discovered lately. And it's a sad story that even the Israelites slipped into that kind of worship. Yeah, Manasseh was one of them. It's disgusting that these things happen. Now, here's a scholarly article from the University of Oxford. And it says that the ancient Carthaginians really did sacrifice their children. After decades of scholarship denying that the Carthaginians sacrificed their children, new researchers found overwhelming evidence that this ancient civilization really did carry out the practice. And this uh, researcher from Oxford University says that Carthaginian child sacrifice is true. This is something the Romans and the Greeks said that the Carthaginians did and it was part of the popular history of Carthage. But in the 20th century, people increasingly took the view that this was racist propaganda. But then archaeology came along and <laughs> they proved it. So this is the value. And I have to ask myself, when we study the book of Nahum, you might be shocked at the expression of God's justice. But Francois, there comes a time when God says, enough. Now, in the world that we are living in, there is as verily child sacrifice being practiced as in the ancient world, under a different form and a different uh, religious connotation, if I may say so, but even in religious circles. And we'll be talking about that as we continue. I want to close with this statement. Henry Ward Beecher said, he was a famous preacher, a person who doesn't know how to be angry doesn't know how to be good. Thomas Fuller wrote, Anger is one of the sinews of the soul. He who lacks it has a maimed mind. There is something called righteous indignation. And Jesus had that. And Jesus portrayed righteous indignation. I wonder whether heaven is experiencing righteous indignation when it looks at the world today and sees some of the issues that are taking place. What do you think? God is love, and his punishment is an exhibition of love. Do you know, my father used to say, your book is almost full. You know, all the naughty things I did. And then I thought he was on page one. <laughs> and then my book was full. I think this world's book is full, and the king is coming. And by the way, Walter, according to the Hebrew of uh, Psalms 48, 
He will weep when he destroy the wicked. But the day of retribution is coming. It's coming. It's coming. And as verily as there was a Jonah, and as verily as there was a Nahum, so this world has received a warning. Some accepted it. Some rejected it. And we are now at the Nahum stage, no longer at the Jonah stage. Because the world had a warning. And they rejected it. We would have healed Babylon. But she will not be healed. Walter, I just want to mention something. You know, at the last verse of the book of Nahum, can you just read it from yes. the Bible? Let's read it. Nahum chapter 3. 3 verse 19. It says, There is no healing of thy bruise basically the same thing that it says to Babylon. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom has not thy wickedness passed continually? And then verse 9 from chapter 1. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. You know, Ranswell, this is the greatest promise in the Bible. This world is a world of suffering and affliction. But when God puts an end to it, when the anti-typical Nineveh finds its retribution, that will be the end of sin and suffering forever and ever. And in the world made new, it will never, ever happen again. So the bottom line is this. We can look forward to a life of eternal conflict, or we can wait for the retributive action of God, and then if we have made the choice to serve the one true God, like that first Ninevite king did, then affliction will not arise ever <laughs> again. Let's pray, Francois. Heavenly Father, it is not coincidental that this book is making world history. And it's not incidental either that the spade of the archaeologist has confirmed or what the Bible has to say about Nineveh. And if there is confirmation at that level, then I believe, Lord, that there will be confirmation of the level that will appear in the times in which we are living. Give us wisdom to deal with these things and to make the right choices. Mm. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.